my family in Christ, I spent the early part of my childhood in a small Wisconsin town called Oconomowoc, which was really fun to learn how to spell in elementary school. Now, Oconomowoc had a couple of defining features. One of them were a number of very beautiful lakes, but another one was the railroad tracks that cut right through the middle of town. And I knew those railroad tracks very, very well because I lived across the street from them. And the thing about railroad tracks is that trains ride on them with surprising regularity. And trains are loud. No matter what time of day it was, you could hear the train coming before it even drove by because the house would start to shake. All of the little handles on dressers and things would dingle, 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 and you knew the train was coming, and then it would roar by, and it would keep going and keep going and keep going and keep going and keep going as the whole house shook. Now, do you know how many times that train woke me up in the middle of the night when I was trying to sleep? Approximately never. It pretty much never woke me up. It came in the middle of the night, it sure did, but I was so used to it, so used to its regularity, so used to its noise and the loudness that my brain just shut it out. It didn't seem that loud or intrusive anymore. It could come roaring by and I would keep snoring away, never the wiser. And, and that is the unfortunate thing about human, humanity, right? It was great when it was a train that could wake me up in the middle of the night. But there are many things that come with regularity that we really shouldn't stay asleep to. And I think Christmas is one of them. Christmas comes and it goes, but it comes every year with surprising regularity. And all of the stuff that comes with Christmas comes roaring into your life. The decorations and the visitors and the parties and the food comes plowing in and even the special service at church. And, and maybe, maybe it becomes so normal. We're so used to it that, that it just doesn't, it doesn't do much anymore. And I think the downside to having this regularity of this, these Christmas celebrations is that maybe we kind of snooze through them. Now, I'm not saying you fall asleep as, you, as you're here at church, hopefully, and, and you don't fall asleep probably when you go to your parties and things, but, but maybe our hearts fall asleep to what should hit us like a freight train with all of the impact and the power of a train coming into our lives, that is the birth of Christ. God made flesh. The incarnate Savior come, having kept the promises made throughout the ages, come not just to be celebrated once a year, but to change the path of your eternal life. That is something that we should not fall asleep through, and yet I think, I think that can happen especially after the celebration is done. Maybe you kind of get the relief that we can start taking down decorations, we can start getting back to normal life, and you kind of hear the rumble of the train getting farther and farther away. Because it just seems so normal now. And that's why it's important for us to constantly go back to God's Word and remind ourselves that there is nothing normal about this event. Therefore, there should be nothing normal about our lives after we remember this event and adore it and worship it and bask in it. There should be nothing normal about you after it because it is the power of a freight train into your life when we look at that manger scene again. And so for today, as we look at perhaps a familiar story to you, the journey of the Magi coming to seek a king that they only knew a little bit. They only knew shadows of this king, what he might be like. As we look at this familiar story, I, I invite you to look at it in an unfamiliar way. To let the impact of what happened here hit you in your heart. To let it wake you up. Because this is really a story of two different reactions to the birth of Jesus. 
And as we read through this account, I think it'll become clear to you what reactions we're going to be looking at. And I think the danger, the danger is that we might have a more in common reaction to somebody negative in this story than we'd like to admit. And so what is the difference here? What is the difference that the star makes? What is the difference that this newborn king makes? That is something that we want to reflect on in a very attentive and dedicated way again today. So please follow along as we read from Matthew chapter 2 and let this freight train come into our lives once again. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem and Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem and Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, and the land of Judah are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. And coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. And they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. This is the word of God. Now, probably a lot of this account isn't colored by what we just read. Probably a lot of this account is actually shaped by a 19th century song called We Three Kings. Because that's the song that paints an image of these three royal kings plodding along on their camels, bearing each one gift for the newborn king. But here's the thing about that song. It's not very biblical. There very well might have been more than three of these wise men or magi. Just because they had three gifts doesn't mean there are only three. Maybe there are only two. We don't know. And they probably didn't travel by themselves. These magi, that was a specific kind of caste or job in Middle Eastern society. And it was an important one. They probably traveled with a whole retinue of people. This wasn't a quiet journey. This was an important journey. And it was a long one, too. Very likely, these men came from maybe uh, somewhere in Persia, maybe even probably Babylon. And so they would have traveled 600 miles to get to Jerusalem. That is not a convenient trip. And yet they dedicated themselves to traveling and following this this special star. Because that's what Magi did a lot. They studied stars. And they saw this special star that perhaps made them recall some messages and stories they had heard long ago from men like Daniel. Or other faithful Jews who lived in Babylon, who were cast out there as slaves when Jerusalem was taken over by the Babylonian Empire. And so they probably had some images of what could be special. What was going to come out of this little tiny kingdom of Israel and yet would be worth their time and their journey and their inconvenience to go see and to go worship it. And so you can imagine what they felt like when they finally got to Jerusalem. Journey is over. They're in the capital city of Israel. This is absolutely where there must be a a celebration. People out in the streets, food, lots of decorations. They must be going crazy over this newborn king. And so when they arrive at the palace in Jerusalem, what do the Magi say? Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. So much excitement. 
They had never seen anything like this before. They wanted to be a part of it. And what did they find in Jerusalem? Nobody who cared. There's a lot of mystery around the Magi. We don't know how many people they were. We don't know exactly where they came from. But I think what we can relate to them is a feeling of disappointment I'm sure they had. To go on this long journey, to expect something that's going to change their life, be something worthwhile to them, and when they get there, nobody knows what they're talking about. And that, I think, removes some of the mystery behind the Magi because that, I'm sure, is something that you can relate to. Any number of things in your life that have been difficult, that you expect to bring you somewhere in your life where finally I can feel comfortable, finally I've found the thing I'm searching for, and yet when you get there, it's maybe not what you expected it to be. Maybe it's the Christmas present that you finally got to open up under the tree is already starting to lose some of its luster and mystique. Maybe it's getting to finally spend time with that family that lives so far away and you realize, oh yeah, this, this is hard to be around other people. Maybe it's finally getting to have kids and it's a lot harder than anybody ever said it would be. Maybe it's your marriage decades into it, and it's not quite the paradise relationship that you saw your parents have. It's any number of things that we, we strive for, we work to, and we expect it to provide that feeling of completion and contentment and joy that we've been waiting for, and yet when we get there, disappointment. Disappointment. And in that, the, the Magi aren't so mysterious. But what maybe is a little bit confusing were, were everybody's reactions to the Magi in Jerusalem. You see, if anybody should have known about this coming king and his birth and be celebrating it, it should have been the people in Jerusalem. They should have been aware of this king coming. And yet, when King Herod is asked about this newborn king, what is King Herod's response? When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. Disturbed? Well, you see, this news of a newborn king hit him like a freight train. He didn't really plan on any new kings being born. You see, we have to remember some things about Herod. We can actually know a lot of things about Herod. He's a historical figure. And Herod, even though he was king of the Jews, he wasn't really Jewish. He was an Edomite. He was really kind of a puppet king put there by the Roman Empire that ruled over Israel. And King Herod had spent a long reign trying to win the hearts of the people. The people liked theater, so he built them an amphitheater. The people needed a new harbor. He built one the likes of which hadn't been seen since King Solomon. The people wanted a new temple. He built one of those too. He even followed Mosaic law. Temples could only be built by Levites and priests, so he had them trained. And that's who built them. King Herod wanted desperately to be known for being great being loved and admired from the people that he ruled. He was so desperate for it that King Herod wasn't just a builder, but he was also a murderer. Herod spent a lot of time trying to make sure he could be on the throne. He killed three of his sons, a wife, an uncle, plenty of court people, all in an attempt to hang on to the thing that he'd been working so hard for. He spent a lot of his own fortune, a lot of time just trying to make sure people respected him, that he was the king, and he wasn't going to let anybody take He got to the destination, and he fought hard to get it. He fought hard to keep it. And now he hears about a newborn king. You better believe Jerusalem was disturbed when they heard about this, because when Herod is disturbed, heads roll. And yet Herod had a very wise reaction. Who did he ask for help? He asked the priests and the teachers of the law. Herod knew where to go to learn about this newborn king. He knew that it must be in the Bible. 
And the reaction of the priests and the teachers of the law is very interesting because they knew exactly what the wise men were talking about. They quoted the prophet Micah right away. Well, the Messiah is supposed to be born in Bethlehem. There he is. And they might be the most tragic people of all in this story. Herod had a very defining guiding star in his life. It was his pride, his selfish ambition, maybe even his fear. The Israelites, they, they should have known better, especially the priests and teachers of the law. And yet when they tell the Magi that the newborn king is in Bethlehem, how many of them volunteer to take the seven-mile journey from Jerusalem to Bethlehem with the Magi? None of them. They just got word from people who traveled hundreds of miles saying that there is something to celebrate, there is something to worship. And their reaction was, good for you. Have fun going over there. Talk about the freight train just whizzing by while everybody is asleep. But yet that is so much of our lives. And so much of our lives where we know exactly where to find God. We don't need to wait for a special miraculous star in the sky. We don't even have to wait for Magi to show up at our houses. We know exactly where to find God. It's in his word. It's in his sacraments. That light shines just as brightly today. It hasn't dimmed. As John put it in John 1, the word of God in the flesh is what happened at Christmas. Well, we have that same word of God with us. And yet, how often do we just kind of let that train whiz by in our life? As we let the Bible gather dust on our shelves? As we approach worship as more like a routine that seems like it instills good morals in our families? And we miss out on what it really means to have a king in our life. To have a king that you can't find in this world. This king that you could spend your life trying to earn your way to get to his footsteps and yet you don't have to. His feet came to you. He was born with feet so those feet could walk for you. A walk a perfect life for you. This king was born with those feet so they could walk carrying a cross for you. This king was born with feet so he could walk out of an empty tomb for you. You don't have to go searching to try to find this king. You know exactly where he is. Don't be asleep. Don't slumber through it. Let that freight train hit you. Hit you where it hurts. That's what happened to Herod. He had to be confronted with his ambition and his selfishness and his fear. And how did he react? Well, when the Magi never came back to report to him, what did he do? He had every boy two, year, two years old and under in Bethlehem killed. Because his star of selfishness and fear was so bright in his life, he couldn't look anywhere else. There was God's word. Staring at him in the face. And he couldn't help but keep looking at the sinful star that had guided him his whole life. It would be foolish for us to think that it can't happen to us. It happened to the Jews. They knew where the king was. But yet they, got, they kept following their star of their own self-righteousness of how good they were, the nation of Israel, God's chosen people. That was their star themselves. And they missed the freight train entering into their lives. We would be missing the train completely if all we think about are the people around us who missed the train. Instead, what we can do, especially this time of year as we approach the new year, is we can let that train of the birth of the Savior hit us right in the hearts, our hearts and show us what our sinful guiding stars are. 
You see, many people, as they reflect on the new year, they just, they just want to forget about it, move on, make the resolutions that they're going to stop keeping two months down the road. But you, since you know the king, you know where to find him, let him hit you. Let him point out to you the false stars that have been guiding your life. Let him point out to you the selfishness. Let him point out to you the lack of love. Let him point out to you all the things that you have failed over this past year. Let it hit you hard. Don't shy away from it. Because as you are hit with that train, Maybe you will finally be knocked out of your slumber and you can look up and see a real star. See a star that's going to give you real hope for the coming year. Because that star is so bright that it shines away the darkness over the last year. Your performance in the last year has nothing to do with who you are anymore because the light is what defines you. The fact that this star has dawned not just for the wise men, but for you. This is what you have to look forward to in the next year. Around this time of year, all kinds of people talk about their journeys. They talk about what they're going to do and what they're going to follow, what's going to define them. You can go into Barnes & Noble and find endless shelves of spirituality. People talk this way, yes, and maybe even we do. We talk about our, our spiritual lives and how I'm on this spiritual journey, and sometimes it can feel so mysterious where we're going and how we're going to get there. But when you look at the star. When you stop setting up your own stars and look at the star that has dawned from God, you can stop being unaware of what's coming up in your life. And you can start being anchored to real hope and therefore real joy and real peace. This is what the writer of the Hebrews speaks of. He says, We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. He's talking about knowing who Christ is and what he's done. That as you see Jesus, not as somebody to be celebrated in a manger once a year, but you see him as the king who was born to fight for you, to conquer for you, to give you a kingdom where you're no longer defined by your, by your past, but defined by Christ's past and what he's already accomplished for you. When you see your king like that, that is when you can have a hope that is not going to be changed by all the disasters that are going to come your way. And as you look at it at the past year, you might see a lot of disasters. Did you know that 2017 had more than 15 natural disasters that cost over a billion dollars to repair? That's a billion dollars for each disaster. 2017 was disastrous. By the very definition of the word. How was your year? Was it just as disastrous? Don't let those disasters become the light in your sky. Don't let it be the consuming thing in your heart. Your king has come. He's greater than those disasters. The hope he has won will outlast the effects of $80 billion worth of disasters. Maybe as you look back at the past year, you had a very good year. Lots of prospering, lots of good things happen. Don't let those blessings outshine the giver of the blessings. See the star for what it is. That the star is the very source of life itself. And that's why you can have hope no matter how many disasters come your way in 2018. Your life might get rocked back and forth and back and forth, but you will be anchored down because you will be anchored down by what has already happened by Christ. You will be anchored down by the power of God itself. And that's a freight train worth listening to. And so as you approach the year, maybe let's remember this prayer from the Apostle Paul, Romans 15. As he said, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. May this be 
your defining prayer for the coming year. Then instead of starting with the point of having your hope for the next year and am I going to exercise enough, instead of having your hope for the next year if I'm going to make this, this much money, instead of having your hope defined for the next year about having finally your house fixed the way it needs to be fixed, have your hope defined by this, by the power of God, by the power of the Spirit with you. Because you don't have to go searching for that kind of hope. You don't have to read a thousand different books in order to learn about it. Just read one. Have that light shine in your life by the word. Be strengthened in it. As you remember your baptism, we're going to talk a lot more about next week. Be assured that this hope, the presence of a hope is right there with you as we celebrate the Lord's Supper. You don't have to go searching. Just don't be asleep when it comes. The light has dawned. Your Savior is here. Let's get on board for 2018. Amen. Please pray with me now. Dear Heavenly Father, we admit our spiritual slumber and all of our wayward ways as we follow our own stars. We confess these things to you because we no longer want them to be part of our lives. We don't want our future to be defined by them. And so we give thanks to you that they don't need to be. Instead, we are defined by your forgiveness, your grace, and the hope that you have won for us. May that be our anchor for this coming year and all the years in our future. In your name we pray. Amen.